Hello, my name is Jonathan. I am an aquarist here at the aquarium. And we are here next to our Tide Pool exhibit, which is sponsored by the Reed family, the great grandchildren of John G. Shedd himself. And we are going to be doing a little tour of the exhibit um, in anticipation of our aquarium mini camp, which is this Saturday. So if you have young aquarium adventurers at home who are excited about this environment, um, you're welcome to check that out and you can see even more cool things about the Tide Pool exhibit. Yeah, let's look at it. So I mentioned the phrase tide pool a lot. What exactly is a tide pool? Well, there is a zone of the ocean called the intertidal zone. Um, and this is where the ocean meets the land. So because of tides, when the tide comes in and comes upland a little bit, and then the tide goes out, and exposes land a little bit. There's kind of that in-between space, which is called the intertidal. Um, and within that space, there can be multiple different types of habitats. So this is an example of a rocky environment that would be in the intertidal. But you can also have sandy beaches um, and other different kinds of things. But this exhibit is modeled after tide pools in the Pacific Northwest. So these species can be found in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and they are very, very well adapted to living in that crazy environment. It doesn't sound crazy from my quick description, but they have to deal with really intense temperature changes. So imagine you're in a little pool of water and the sun is beating down on you. And this water is typically around 55 degrees Fahrenheit. But if it's isolated like that out in the sun, it's going to heat up a lot. Um, so they have to deal with that. And then if it rains or there's a river nearby that's emptying out fresh water, that will drastically change the salt content of the water that they're in. So typically full strength seawater is what these animals are used to, but they might have half strength seawater or even less than that. There's also really intense wave action in that environment. So a lot of these animals are really, really good at holding on to the surface that they're stuck onto. The anemones look like they don't move, but they've actually got a big foot that's at the base of them that they use to hang on. You could probably check out this other anemone. What, that's right there. So they can hold on even though the waves are crashing against them really intensely. And there's also some sea stars down there. And sea stars have hundreds or thousands of really small, what's called tube feet that they use to adhere to surfaces. So they're very, very difficult to get off of surfaces. <laughs> they also use those to eat prey. Um, so temperature, salt, waves. And then the last one, which it's probably the most obvious is that if some of these animals don't move or can't move and the water goes below them, then they are out of the water. So a lot of animals do have adaptations to allow them to survive for periods of time outside of the water. The most obvious one in typhal environments, the couple, are barnacles, which stay closed up. And we've got some model barnacles along this exhibit. Um, and then the other one are anemones. And anemones can actually close up as well. Um, and in doing that, they retain the moisture that's inside their body so they don't dry out. But other animals like crabs um, may retreat to an area that's wet enough where they're able to still breathe. Um, but fish have to be entirely under the water. So if the tide is receding, they'll stay in a tight pool zone. You may notice that a lot of these animals are pretty colorful, and we've got lots of those bright pink strawberry anemones down there. A lot of people may think that the cold, dark parts of the ocean are not very colorful, but as you can tell, a lot of these animals have some pretty awesome colors. We've got a grunt sculpin that's hanging out right below the camera right now. <laughs> these guys are really, really cool because 
he's not in a barnacle shell right now, but what they typically do is they will reside inside of an empty barnacle shell and their tail fin, the one on the end, looks sort of like a barnacle's feeding appendages. So they will whack, move their tail around and it basically can make it look like they are a barnacle to hide from predators. Hello, I am an aquarius at the aquarium and we are looking at the tide pool habitat in our Pacific Northwest area of the aquarium. This exhibit is sponsored by the Reed family, the great grandchildren of John G. Shedd himself. And we are doing a little tour of this habitat in anticipation of some aquarium mini camps that we have this weekend, where one of them will be looking at this environment and even doing a feeding. So if you are at home and interested in this habitat and you want to learn more after today, definitely check that out. gliding around. What are some of the animals we're seeing right here? Um, the big orange shape in the middle of the view there is a giant California sea cucumber. These guys are what we call detritivores, which means like you would call something an herbivore or a carnivore, carnivore, these animals eat detritus. So they've got frilly arms that we can't really see right now in our view, but they use that to sift through waste on the bottom of the ocean floor or bacterial mats and interesting things like that that we don't have any interest in eating. And that's how they eat. There's also some pink strawberry anemones. I call those anemones, but they're actually solitary corals. Um, and at the base of the view, we've got a purple sea urchin. And this is a really iconic species in Pacific Northwest tide pool environments because purple sea urchins can just coat the tide pool. And they burrow down into the rock, they bore a hole into it, and they will actually stay in one spot if they can their whole life, as long as they're getting some algae. Urchins are herbivores, so we feed our urchins a combination of different types of commercial algae that we can buy. The seaweed. What are the little tubes moving around on, on the urchin? The urchins have the most obvious part of their body are the spines. So they can use their spines to help them move. Um, it's defensive because if something tries to eat the urchins, there are a few fish that are adapted to eating urchins, but in general, they're pretty spiky. So they're rather difficult to eat. But they also have tube feet, which um, you'll see waving around, but that is actually how the urchins attach to a surface. So if I were to put my hand on that urchin and try to move it, it would be very, 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 very difficult because they're using a hundred of those two feet to stick onto the rock surface. And then they actually have a third part of their body that we don't normally see that has a really fancy technical name called a pedicillary. And they stick those out to kind of clean small animals or algae off the surface of their body. Because as you can imagine, without having arms like we can that can clean our bodies, they would not be able to control what is on them. So they've got that really awesome adaptation to keep themselves clean. There's another herbivore close by. Um, the abalones that are in this exhibit came to us from an abalone farm in California that actually cultures them for human food. Um, but so these guys are entirely herbivores, so we also feed them seaweeds. 
You can see some of their sensory tentacles sticking out of those holes on their shell. Abalone are pretty well known because their iridescent shell on the underside is used in jewelry. Um, and some species on the west coast and around the world are threatened or endangered because they were overfished. This species in particular is called the red abalone and they are very plentiful on the west coast. <laughs> there is another sea star nearby called the vermilion sea star. Probably one of the most brightly colored animals in here. These guys are almost similar to the sea cucumber where I don't purposely feed the vermilion stars. They will kind of scoot along and find what they want to eat themselves and they may eat really small bits of the food that I feed um, but they are scavengers. The anemones on the other hand that are in here you don't think by looking at them that they are predators, but anemones are actually really intense predators. <laughs> they are in the same group of invertebrates as jellyfish and corals, and they have the same type of stinging cells that jellyfish have. And if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish or know about getting stung by a jellyfish, you know it's not fun. These species of anemone in here aren't strong enough to hurt us, but basically anemones are sit and wait for ambush predators. They kind of hang out in one spot and they wait for a small fish or shrimp or some other animal to stumble into their um, tentacles on the top of their body right there and then they will close up. So they sting the animal that falls into that and they close up and their mouth is in the center of their body. And there's a few different species in here. The one that we're seeing most often is called the giant green anemone, which is a very iconic species in the Pacific Northwest. What do they do when the tide gets low? Anemones have a really cool adaptation for keeping wet. They actually, this whole disc on the top of their body that has all those tentacles coming off of it can actually close up so they can pull all of those tentacles into their body. Um, and by keeping clothes really tight, um, they are able to retain moisture inside of their body. Um, and that prevents them from drying out. Anemones can move around with that big foot that's at the base of their body. They do move, but when they find a spot where, there's, where they like the water movement and they're getting food occasionally, they typically don't move. So a lot of these anemones in this exhibit this exhibit's been around for decades, and I've been taking care of it for a couple of years, and I have not seen most of these enemies move ever. <laughs> they find a spot and they like it. And same with the purple sea urchins. We've got some costumes. So, we received some questions. What, what is the smallest animal in the tide pool? That is a good question. I'm probably gonna have to say these strawberry anemones are the smallest animal. So altogether, if you're far enough away, it looks like one giant mat of pretty pink and red. But individually, each of those solitary corals are pretty small. Um, and these animals would eat plankton as it flies by. So when I put a little bit of planktonic food in here, really small microscopic animals, they will just grab it as they come by because they have the same stinging cells that the giant green anemones have, but their strength is a lot different because they're way smaller. So they eat very, very, very small stuff. Another question that we got is how many different animals are in the tide pool? There are just over 20 species in this exhibit of animals. Um, a few species of anemones, a couple species of sea star, 
our abalone, a couple species of sea urchin, <laughs> um, a couple hermit crabs. Oh, and there's also a handful of species of fish. We've actually got a black eyed goby peeking his head out right there of that rock. <laughs> So these are a small species of fish um, that we call benthic, which means they live on the bottom of the ocean. So you can see that one is peeking out of the rock, but it's on the bottom of the water, as opposed to the perch that is swimming by right now, which lives in the water column. <laughs> it's like, coming to check it out. What's going on? Someone asked, do we need to add food and what do we feed? Um, I've been kind of sporadically talking about feeding um, and the sea cucumbers and the vermilion sea stars I actually don't really directly feed. But the anemones that eat, oh look at that. <laughs> so we actually have a sailfin sculpin coming out right now. This is another bent species, but they are a really awesome species of fish because they've got a gorgeous um, dorsal fin, which is the fin on the top of their body, and they kind of wave that. And their front fin on the top of their body is really, really, really tall. So that's how they got their name, sail fin. Can I try to chase them? <laughs> we might see another one come out. Uh, but yeah, so feeding. So the the smaller fish in here, the black eyed goby, the sail fin sculpin, and the um, Bronze, I feed pretty often every couple days. They get small frozen seafood. The anemones and the sea stars only eat a couple times a week, which a lot of times when I'm down here by the exhibit talking to visitors, they're pretty shocked about because it's hard to imagine us or animals eating only a couple times a week. But these animals live in really cold water. They've got very, very slow metabolism. They move very slowly. Um, and most invertebrates and even fish, which are invertebrates, um, don't regulate their body temperature like we do. So we spend a lot of energy keeping our body at a specific temperature, but the body, the bodies of all these animals in this exhibit is also 55 degrees, the same as their environment. So they don't use as much energy as we do. But yeah, these anemones and the sea stars eat meat, so I feed a really, really big variety of food. Um, all different types of fish, uh, clams, squid, krill, small shrimp, small frozen shrimp. Uh, but the cool thing about feeding this exhibit is that I basically wait until other areas in um, the aquarium have extra food, and then I just chop that up and give it to them. So they get some pretty good fish, actually. The anemones regularly get salmon, which is extra from our wild reef um, gallery with our large sharks. But when they have extras, then they get a fancy fish. <laughs> they eat better than I do. <laughs> uh, the water temperature, someone asked about the water temperature, and I mentioned it's 55 degrees. Um, Northern California, or, or Oregon are about 50 to 55. Um, as you get up into Washington and Alaska, it gets much colder than that. Uh, but most of these species are from around there. Someone wanted to know, when the tide comes in, do the animals leave? Um, I mentioned that some animals, like crabs, may find a wet or moist environment that's out of the water that can keep them alive. Um, but when the tide comes back in and they're covered again, some animals like fish may go to a different area, but for the most part, the invertebrates that are in this exhibit, the sea urchins, the anemones, the cucumber, those guys all live in the tidal, in the intertidal zone, and they will stay there no matter where the tide is. Um, they're just so well adapted to that environment that they're good no matter what their condition is. Someone asked if we change the tides. So this exhibit does not 
change water level. So the, the animals that are underwater are always underwater pretty much. I guess the anemones could technically go out of the water if they wanted to, but I have never seen them come out of the water because I don't think they necessarily need to do that. Um, on the other end of the exhibit, where the water is not coming in, we have a pump that does give them a variable flow, so they get a little bit different water action. But most of the time, I am the wave, so I come through every day and fluff up the anemones and give them a little bit of wave action. <laughs> to know where are tide wolves. Um, I mentioned we've been talking a lot about the Pacific Northwest because this exhibit is modeled after the Pacific Northwest. Um, there are tide wolves in certain places on the East Coast, um, but in my experience, in my travels to the East Coast, I have found that it's much more often sandy intertidal environments than rocky. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why this exhibit is focused on the Pacific Northwest because there are just a crazy amount of awesome diversity over there in tide pools throughout the whole coast. And part of that, um, the reason why it's cold is because the um, Pacific Ocean over there has a really cool process called upwelling that brings nutrients from the deep cold water up. Um, so that's part of the reason why even if you go to California, it's cold over there, but in Florida, the water's warm. Because um, in the Pacific, there's that really cool upwelling action which keeps the water cool and brings lots of nutrients to the shallows. That perch is really loving the camp. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to our Tide Pool tour today. Once again, if you have found the Tide Pool fascinating and you're interested, we are offering an aquarium mini camp this Saturday where young aquarium adventurers will be able to see some of these animals actually eat. So definitely check that out.